Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Dick, and I am a very grateful alcoholic. Uh, my uh, sobriety date is June the 8th, 1977. And my home group is the Macklin Group in Powder Springs, Georgia. Um, and we have meetings on Wednesday. We have three meetings on Thursday, Saturday, and we've got a new and, and a women's meeting on Monday. I don't go to that that often. So, we but we started off. This was, you know, we learned from our literature that if we don't like our home group or we can't find a home group that's perfect for us, we can help change that hope group so that it becomes something that we're looking for. And that was the case. Um, I got cancer, terminal cancer, uh, about 10 years ago, and um, we had to move out to uh, the uh, a much less expensive place to live in. And we went around looking for meetings. I couldn't find anything I really liked, but there was one small meeting that had about 8 to 10 people, nice people, and they didn't really have much going on, good or bad. There wasn't didn't have any problems with it, so I decided to stay there. They had an Al-Anon meeting across the hall that Barbara could go to, and so that that I could make a contribution to it. And it was basically uh, no uh, group conscience, no discussions. They just got together and had a meeting. Well, I stayed long enough. I didn't just jump right into it, but after about six months, I asked if we could start having group conscience meetings. Then I suggested that we set up something so that we could end up uh, getting make sure everybody that came to the group got a job. The same things that happened to me when I got sober in Louisville, Kentucky, back in the 70s. And finally, the group started going along with it. And then I asked if I could be the greeter chair. And we only had eight or ten people, and they laughed. Uh, but we did that so that every time somebody came to our meeting, they knew that they were loved. And uh, that's what I got in Louisville, Kentucky when I got sober. I never went to a meeting where I didn't feel like those people wanted me to be there. I felt welcome and loved and cared for the whole time by everybody in the group. And that was, uh, let's see, eight years ago. And today we have, on that same night where we had 10 people, we have 200 people. And we're not in Atlanta. We're in a little town outside of it. Um, But we have a meeting. we got so many people that came to the regular Thursday night meeting that we started a beginner's meeting uh, for one, steps one through three and and uh, surrender. And then we started another meeting, four through nine, for people that had gotten, and then you come out to the big room. And that led us to want to study the tradition. So we have a 12-step and 12 tradition meeting on Saturday night. The women wanted, I have no idea what they do in their group, but they wanted to meet on Monday night. And that's just from a little bit of effort and making sure that we're there to greet people. We've gone from 10 to 200 people in a small town, and we attract a lot of people that we're not comfortable. So if you're in a group and you're not crazy about it, see what you can do to improve it, because it certainly pays off. I uh, want to thank the committee um, for inviting us. Uh, this is a very special weekend for us, and it was always a special weekend. I came to my first um, tri-state in 1977 and heard uh, a fellow named Jack Brennan. These people are all past now, but a fellow named Jack Brennan from up in uh, New York who had had every bone in his body broken and got sober. Um, He was out on the streets. But Chuck Chamberlain was the Sunday morning speaker, and if you don't know who he is, you need to pick up a copy of New Pair of Glasses. Uh, And this room was full of enthusiasm and love, and I'd never seen anything like it. It was the first conference I'd ever been to, convention I'd ever been to. And, um, and and so I appreciate the fact that you were here for me then and that you're here for us now. Uh, I want to thank Mike for um, uh, chairing us and and, uh, and Steve, who's just gone way out of his way. We had a, you know, we talked today about living life on life's terms. Well, to get here, a couple of weeks ago I was on the way to speak on a Thursday night meeting down there and somebody uh, knocked in the driver's door about a foot, a uh, big SUV that hit my little Civic. And um, uh, and so that car went out. We had another car that was waiting to have the uh, uh, transmission fixed, so we decided we'd take the expedition. And uh, uh, two days ago, found out it needed new bearings up front, couldn't fit it, so we had to rent a car. 
And then in the middle of this, I got an infection that I had to show the doctor. So we didn't get here till I think, it's 10 o'clock Friday night. No discomfort, anything. Steve showed up and took us out to eat for a wonderful meal. And uh, it just, that was the spirit of this thing, you know, uh, 38 years ago, and it's still the spirit. You all do a great job, and I, I appreciate it. I want to apologize to Bill and Pearl because I d did miss them. I listened to their tape, and uh, uh, I had a nice conversation with Pearl. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from them. I, I've known Tim. Tim Tim was recommended to me by uh, Bob Bazant, one of my friends, and said, you got to meet this guy. He's a great guy, and he is, and I'm looking forward to hearing him tomorrow. Um, and Amy was uh, gave a wonderful talk uh, uh, this morning. Uh, but I must say that the best speaker of the weekend was the al speaker. Um, no, I must say that the – and uh, so – and Barbara and I are blessed because we get to travel and uh, go to some of these, you know, together, and this is a, a, a great thing for us. Uh, and this is another special occasion for us, uh, or for me. My best friend in high school is sitting on the front row. His name is Mike down here. And um, – he is not in our program because he doesn't need to be in our program, but he, he and I ran together and did just about every stupid thing you could possibly do. It's just that he had a little line that he didn't quite go over, and I'll cover that on one of the stories that comes out. But uh, this is the first time he's heard the story, and so he's in about half, half the uh, fiascos, and then there are a few that happened while he knew me but didn't know that that's what I was doing. So it'll be an interesting to get his feedback after this. I come from a family of, um, you know, several people today have talked about families that, uh, uh, you know, where there were problems within the family before theirs, and that's not the case with me. I did not come from a wealthy family, but I came from a family of honor. And this is how messed up my priorities were. I didn't tell m many people what my dad did because my dad was in the military. And we lived in this region where I went to high school where a lot of kids were wealthy. And we weren't wealthy. And uh, so I, I didn't say much because I wasn't really all that proud uh, uh, at the time. But here's who my family is. My name is Richard Jefferson Anderson, Richard Chloe Anderson, the first one of us here, was born in Virginia when Kentucky was part of Virginia um, in 1750. And then... Um, And on Christmas Day of 1776, Captain Richard Chloe Anderson was the commander of the first boat across the Delaware under George Washington, later became a general at uh, uh, Valley Forge. His grandson, uh, Richard Heron Anderson, was a two-star at uh, Antietam and a three-star general at Gettysburg. And um, he was my dad's um, uh, great-grandfather. My dad was one of the most decorated pilots in World War II. Uh, two had uh, 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 what's called the um, the Army Cross, which, like the Navy Cross, is next to Medal of Honor. Um, and uh, my little sister is a retired bird colonel. Her husband's a retired bird colonel. Their boy graduated from West Point, a major, etc., uh, etc. Et and basically, I'm like um, it's like being in Lieutenant Dan's family, except I'm Forrest Gump without the focus or the integrity. <laughs> so this was, uh, so I didn't fit in. I knew I didn't fit in. I couldn't articulate anything that I'm talking about now when I was a kid, but I just knew and I felt it. Um, everything that we were involved in back then was something that had the same values that we talk about in AA all the time. Um, and I was a member of uh, YMCA, Little League, uh, 4-H, Boy Scouts, um, you know, our, the creed in, in Boy Scouts in our handbook said that we please God best when we do something to help another person each day anonymously. It's exactly what we do here. But I felt ill at ease. I couldn't tell anybody what I really felt like. I knew I wasn't like the rest of my family because when they get together, all these people come in, you know, all our aunts, uncle, everybody was military. And, and they were heroes, and I knew I didn't fit in, so I couldn't really tell them. But I pretended to do all the things. My parents thought that I was extremely happy, but I just felt like I couldn't fit in. Um, there was one place where I did fit in, and that was at the time I was growing up, a new invention came out uh, in the 50s, a little black and white thing called a television set. And um, uh, when we got one, I, my whole life changed. I, and the shows that I watched were shows that had great 
uh, moral values too. It's a uh, Andy Griffith show, Leave It to Beaver, um, Ozzie and Harriet, um, Father Knows Best. And so I would watch these shows, and they became the place where I learned how to live life. I couldn't talk to my baseball coach. I couldn't talk to the scout leaders. I certainly couldn't tell anybody my family was going on. But I could um, watch this show. And if Opie or Wally ever had some kind of problem, uh, then they would talk to Dad, and Dad would just take his pipe and turn it to one side, say something not judgmental, but but and and they would get the message. So. Um, the way I learned how to live life was to watch Opie and Wally and see how they handled their problems, and, and that helped, that worked for me. I had my first spiritual experience when I was maybe six, seven years old at a place called the East Drive-In in Louisville, Kentucky. Not there anymore, but Mike knows the place well, a um, place we went a lot in high school. And for the first time, I saw something in color. Television was black and white then. There wasn't any color option. But this was huge. It was on a screen that was 120 feet wide, not only in color, it was in technicolor. And uh, uh, the big book says that lack of power is our dilemma. And that's really, if I could have articulated exactly how I felt back then, I would have said, I feel like I don't have the power that the rest of my family has. I don't have, I, I don't feel like a hero. I'm, I'm not honest. I don't have integrity. I couldn't, I couldn't say that because I didn't really know what I was doing. I just felt like I didn't fit in. But that night, up there on the screen, was more power than I'd ever seen. Um, and there was a guy that stood up there, and he would take his staff and just push it to one side, and the wind would blow through his hair, and the Red Sea parted. And the film was The Ten Commandments, uh, uh, and the guy with the power was Moses. And so I made two decisions that night. One, I decided that... Uh, I wanted to do whatever that was up there. And I've either made or not made a living writing and producing for the last uh, 40 some odd years. So God was listening and, and, and heard my cry. And, but the other decision I made was that I wanted to be on God's side. Whatever, uh, whatever happened, I wanted to see because that's where the real power was. Because I had seen what uh, Charlton Heston had done to Yul Brynner. So the next day, on the Sunday, I go down the aisle at Linden Baptist Church, uh, much to the surprise of my parents, who did not know I was having a spiritual experience in the back of the 55 Ford, and I surrendered all. Uh, the song was, We Surrender All. And I think I was probably about this tall, and I came down the aisle, and I got dipped and dunked, and because I thought, that's what's wrong with me. We're here. There's power. I saw it last night, and I'm going to go down there and get some of this power, and I'll be like the rest of my family. I was like the newcomer who comes to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you come here, and it's exciting, and there's enthusiasm. And, you know, enthusiasm comes from the Greek in theos. It means God in us. So I, I felt that. I saw that. And um, I would, like that newcomer who comes here, sees it, feels it, but doesn't take any steps to change. And nobody told me I needed to take any steps to change. We didn't have sponsors and, uh, you know, uh, vacation Bible school. So uh, so I'm now, so I go down the aisle, I, I'm ready, and I'm ready for my life to change, and I didn't take any steps to change, so it didn't change. And after a few days, weeks, whatever it was, I was still the scared little Baptist Boy Scout. And so I felt, and carried this for a long time, that I was not one of the chosen ones. There was an expression that, you know, you know, God had the chosen ones. And, you know, if you've played ball and you're out there and they go down the row and they pick this guy for a team and this guy for a team, and you're the last one standing and you don't get picked on a team, you know you're not the chosen one. And that's exactly how I felt. And that's the way I lived my life for a long time. I was angry that God didn't choose me. I mean, why would I not be chosen? And, and so uh, I, I lived my life in this defiance. You know, we talked about it today. Defiance is the opposite of humility, and that's what I thrived on was defiance. I was angry at God. But I was angry in God in the same way that I would be angry at a, a, a beautiful girl that I wanted to go out with who decided she wouldn't go out with me. And Mac, Mike used to come over to, he went to a different high school, but he came over to my high school, and there was one particular girl, and I had asked her out and um, uh, a couple times, and instead of just saying no, she put me down in front of several people. So I was pretty quick with words, so he'd come over there, and I'd be calling her all kinds of names. She'd be calling me all kinds of names, and that would go up and down the hallway. He thought it was funny. 
the deal was I appeared to be absolutely angry. I hated this girl. I didn't use the word girl. I hated her, etc., etc. But what I really wanted was for her to call me and say, you know, I'm really stupid. I don't know what was going on, but you're a one hot guy, and I would like for you to come over and pick me up. So for a long time in my life, I was acting one way, but on the, but underneath, I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be cared for. I wanted that girl to go out with me, and I wanted God uh, to say, yes, I'm, I'm going to take you. You're my child. You're my son. I have, st- I have faith in you. So I lived that way for many, many years, but I didn't tell many people what was really going on with me. I would never have had this conversation with Mike. Mike came from a family where his mom and dad were just very wonderful people, very strong, good character. So did I. And I acted like I fit in on the outside, but I didn't. And I didn't feel comfortable. I had my next spiritual experience when I was 14. Uh, a buddy of mine named Dave who played uh, left field, and I played uh, center field on a Babe Ruth League team. And uh, we were camping out, and his older brother had gotten him a six-pack of beer and a half pint of gin. And Dave dro- drank the gin, and I drank the beer. And from the very beginning, I was not a stay-at-home drunk. I was a go-to-town drunk, and going to town when you're, uh, uh, when you're 13 or 14 means uh, hitchhiking. And so we hitchhiked up to a place called the White Castle. Do they have White Castles in Owensboro? Well, whatever. It's where you go when, at 3 o'clock in the morning when you're really, really drunk, and you want a dozen of those burgers with 8 million onions on them, and you think it's a good idea until the next day when you get up and realize it wasn't such a great idea. So I go in there, we go to, we hitchhike up to White Castle, I am feeling no pain. All of the fear, all of the doubt, the feeling that I didn't fit in is gone. I just felt absolutely, I, I, I fit in. We go up there, there was a beautiful redhead behind the counter, and this is when you can actually sit there and eat at the counter. Beautiful redhead, and I'm flirting with her, and hoping for something good to come out of this. I'm 14, she's 30, and um, so, and... I was very shy about adults, police, any any kind of authority figure. I didn't say much. But that night, I discovered table hopping. So I was bouncing around, and I'm talking to somebody. I said, you know, tell them what I'm doing in homeroom and so forth. How are you doing? And this guy's, you know, owns an insurance company. So, you know, hitting it off, really had a great time. I could tell that, you know, these people like me. And um, uh, my buddy Dave was not having the same spiritual experience I was. Dave was starting to get a little woozy. And I had never had a cup of coffee, but I had seen in Perry Mason where if you have too much to drink, you have a little bit of coffee and it sobers you up so you can talk to the police. <laughs> so that's what I did. I got Dave a cup of coffee and it did not have the desired effect. In fact, Dave threw up down the whole stainless steel counter which was the station for my red-headed girlfriend. So this is not making me happy. He's messed up my relationship already. And it turns out, if you're looking for a Louisville City policeman at um, uh, 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever time it was, the best place to find him is at the White Castle. So they came down and asked me what was wrong with my friend. And I said, oh, nothing. He's just had a little bit too much to drink. Really? Well, how old is he? 14. How old are you? 14. So I was in Louisville City Jail four hours after I took my first drink. And that was pretty much the end of my social drinking. I drank as much as I could whenever I could from that time forward. And um, uh, I can tell you, Mike and I hung out at this bar called Duchess Tavern that was up in St. Matthews and hung out so much up there that I was tending bar in the place when, when I was a junior in high school. And um, we just, you know, that was, life changed incredibly. Uh, my dad, who, you know, one of the finest men that I've ever known, uh, said, you can't behave that way and stay in this house. They just, I'm the first alcoholic of record. They didn't have any nutcases like me before me. So they didn't really know what to do with me. And uh, my dad was a good man, and he was actually very loving, but he didn't know what to do with me. He didn't know how to respond. So when he said that you can't stay here if you're going to behave that way, I'm pretty sure he was trying to get me to behave differently. Instead, I split an apartment with several guys that I knew, and the idea of the apartment for those guys was um, that they had a place to go party. 
because the apartment costs us $55 a month, and there were like 10 of us pitching in on it. So, But I was the only one who tended to stay there a lot. And I really, I actually used this to emotionally blackmail my mother because she wanted to see me. And, you know, I, I played everybody against everybody once I started drinking. I, I literally, it just happened like that. And um, with the exception of a few people. Uh, and and so uh, I was arrested uh, 22 times before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was arrested six times my last year or so in high school. I was arrested at my senior prom, was my first really big adventurous arrest. Uh, most of them had been um, public drunkenness or that kind of stuff, uh, behavior. But um, I had, uh, at my senior prom, I was arrested. Um, and, and Louisville senior prom is the same weekend as the Derby. And so um, uh, my parents really didn't know where I was because I'd be staying at the apartment some nights and then come back other nights and so forth. But they found out where I was on Saturday because on Friday night we had our prom. And um, on Saturday morning they saw me on ABC, NBC, and CBS News because I thought I knew all about race relations because we had two black kids that went to the high school I went to out of about 3,000, and I got along with both of them and so forth. But I found out a little bit more that night because um, – Seven Black Panthers were in town to help blow up Churchill Downs, and um, um, I was uh, put in a cell with seven Black Panthers. So the next morning, ABC, NBC, and CBS News, here are the seven Black Panthers, and Dickie in his powder blue tuxedo jacket. And the other kids didn't get to do stuff like that. I mean, they were concentrating on going to Princeton or Harvard or Yale or Brown or, or the uh, West Point or something, you know. But my life was an adventure already. I was going to be a great writer. And however I arrived at that, I don't know, but I actually was good at writing. And that's, you know, led me to the career I'm in, or not in right now. But uh, at any rate, so I, I get get locked up. Now I am over 18. So this is an adult, regular, this is not a juvie offense. And um, I was just very, very lucky that um, the principal and a couple other people actually testified on my behalf, and I did not go to prison, but I could have gotten 10 or 15 years at that point. So once I started drinking, I always knew that I would quit or fail. So everything was just to have a good time. Um, you know, um, Mike and I, one weekend we were partying. He lived, his parents had a big house out in the country and a great place to be. And he was kind of whining about uh, this girl that uh, uh, named Betsy Ross, the beautiful girl. But he wanted to see her and stuff, and he was kidding. I went in the other room, called, booked us uh, airfare to go down to uh, Fort Lauderdale and um, uh, so that we could get down there. And the adventure starts, just like this trip. And on the way there, I was driving a... a a BMW, which would do about 135, which is about what I was doing when we passed a Jefferson County cop. The light came on, and um, we get stopped. Now, I didn't outrun it. I was smart enough, stop, polite, everything. And uh, the the two county cops said, uh, uh, said we, know, we don't know how fast you're going, but it was over 125, and if we put that down, we got to lock you up. So I'm going to give you a ticket for going 100, and you're still going to have a pretty good uh, fee, but... Uh, so forth. And then they said, this is how much things have changed. And by the way, I'd watch the open containers of beer or bourbon, whatever we were drinking, because so, in the city, uh, they'll lock you up for that. So anyway, we got back in the car, got to the airport, and I was, you know, we didn't see, I never saw any kind of drugs in high school, uh, or college for that matter, really. Uh, uh, but, um, uh, and, I, and I, I thought that people who did drugs uh, lacked uh, self-discipline. And so, and I'm not saying that I didn't smoke a few joints or accidentally do LSD on a plane ride one time, uh, but um, Mike and I get to the airport, have a little bit of time to get a drink before we get on the plane. We drink some more on the plane, and the plane had to stop in Atlanta. We change planes. Then the plane, the new plane run, goes to Tampa and then over to Fort Lauderdale. And so there was a guy sitting next to us. This is back in the days when you could smoke cigarettes on, on flights. And uh, <clears throat> there's a guy sitting next to, and we're giving him a hard time because we're continuing our drinking bench. And um, 
uh, and, and I asked the guy, I said, what, you don't get high? And he said, he didn't say anything. He just pulled out a big joint from under his ear, lights it, passed it back and forth. I took it, Mike took it, go back and forth. Then he hands this uh, inhaler, and he hands it to me, and I just, I did it. And um, Mike, who is not an alcoholic, has the audacity to say, what is it? And um, see, this is the difference between an alcoholic and a non-alcoholic. He actually wants to know what he's putting in his body. So uh, the guy says, it's acid. And Mike says, no thanks. So I, there I am dressed up in my best um, kind of wide brownish-gray bell-bottoms, a double-breasted uh, blue blazer, kind of a silky shirt, hip, you know, boots. Um, and, um, and so this starts hitting. You know, after the guy got off at Tampa, and we're going from Tampa to Fort Lauderdale, now it starts hitting. And I give a running dialogue to the people on the plane of the two whales that are jumping over the wing. One of them is a boy, and one of them is a girl, because one is blue and one is pink. And um, so, um, and Mike's sitting there trying to explain what's going on to the stewardess back then, now called flight attendant. Uh, and uh, somewhere, I'm having a great time great adventure, but somewhere along the way before we landed, I lost all motor skills. So they had to tie me in like this. Uh, saliva's coming out of my mouth like this. We've got two of the most beautiful girls you've ever seen going to meet us right outside the airport at Fort Lauderdale. And this is in March in the, in this, you know, at that time of the year in Kentucky, it's cold. But when you get down to Fort Lauderdale, it's like 85, 90 degrees, whatever it was. So as he's pushing, they had to use a wheelchair to get me off the plane, out, we're going to meet our two dates. It's Mike looking pretty good and me. And as, they, as, they, as the heat hits, all of a sudden, I just throw up all over everybody. So I spent the next two days in a hotel room trying to just see if I could urinate properly. And, um, uh, and Mike has two girls for, the, for that period. The difference between us and them. So... I already knew that I would quit just about anything. I already knew that, you know, if I was in a relationship with a girl that I needed to find another girl because I was going to mess this one up. Same thing with college, anything else. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, I was going to, originally my parents had taken me to this high school I went to because they had an advanced program that would help me to get into one of the Ivy League schools. But by the time I got through, I actually had to use my uncle, who was a dean at UK, to get me into UK. And at that time, they were supposed to take everybody, except if you have too much of a police record. So um, anyway, I'm down at UK, still try I'm trying to figure out. There was a period there, Mike and I were talking about, where, you know, we weren't really in college. We weren't really working. We were just, I don't, it was kind of a limbo zone trying to find out about life. And um, uh, so... <clears throat> I was with a bunch of guys, and all of our parents were brave. They were all, you know, the greatest generation. They were, they were all military and served well. And so uh, the, we were talking, Mike wasn't there for this. This was down at the University of Kentucky, and we were there um, talking about, uh, and, and Mike had gone to Western. So, and we're talking about with these guys, and we're sitting there saying, well, you know what we should do is all eight of us should go down tomorrow and join the Marine Corps. So this was a great idea that night. And I said, no, let's join this. No, let's so, and the next day I get up and I get ready to go down and list. And nobody remembers making this pledge except for me. So I was the only one that ended leaving that town on a bus at any time thereafter, taking off to go to boot camp, etc. I was, I put in for uh, assignments. I put in for Key West, Key West, Key West. I got uh, Vietnam, Vietnam, and the Pentagon, and um, uh, and so, uh, you know, again, I did okay. I got promoted to E6, which is five promotions in the first four years, but my last, I did okay in combat. What I didn't do okay in was the Pentagon, because you had to be up at 5.30 in the morning getting ready to set things up for the generals who were coming in for 6 a.m., 6.30 meetings. I was engaged six Six times before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, nobody ever married me, but I was engaged six times, and almost all of them were somebody that I thought looked like somebody I'd met in the movies. And um, uh, uh, this girl, my current fiancé at the time, was working the 4 a.m. to 12 noon shift at the local 
massage parlor, and so I would be dropping her off at 4 o'clock in the morning and then have an hour and a half to go back, get dressed up, and go to work. So I could say I, I just saw that, that a military career was not in the cards for me like it was for the rest of the family. So I decided to go back to Louisville. I come back. A friend of mine who was a drinking buddy, a guy named Frank, says um, uh, he would introduce me to a girl that lives upstairs who looked kind of like Olivia Newton-John. And so I was very, I'd had quite a few when I first met her, but I thought she looked like Olivia Newton-John anyway. Um, so I meet her, um, and we are just absolutely going uh, great guns in this relationship. I move back to Louisville. I'm working for an advertising agency. I'm actually doing really good work at this ad agency. I am living in this place where there are about 10 or 12 apartments, and you have to know somebody to get in there. Mike and his wife live there, some other people, and really tight group. We had a pool out there. On Sunday morning, you get up, and, and uh, whoever gets up first rings the bell. We go out and play volleyball out there. And, uh, you know, a lot of those guys were married, a uh, very conservative crowd. Um, uh, and so... Um, uh, I wasn't married, but if I had to stay over, I'd bring her out on Sunday morning. And, and, uh, so anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I, I, this girl upstairs, they live in Newton John. I fall in love with her. We're just as passionate as we can be. We decide we're going to get married. We're talking about when we want to go to Key West for the honeymoon. We were just trying to figure out what to do with her husband. And, um, and so, um, uh, you know, but, you know, they say that alcoholics don't have willpower. We have great willpower. I stuck in there and stuck in there, and I helped this woman get out of that bad relationship that she was in. And we had the wedding date set for sometime in May. I can't remember exactly the date, but we're going to get, and we're going to Key West for the honeymoon. We've got all this set up. Um, and we had a few run-ins. Uh, her husband was a an attorney and uh, an advance man for uh, uh for Nixon, who was running for re-election, and uh, so he was gone a lot, um, and uh, like I said, he was an attorney. We had different training. Uh, uh, we had several run-ins. I went after him a few times with a shotgun, and uh, he came after me with, as I said, he's an attorney, a uh, warrant, so, um, <laughs> but I didn't give up. I got her out of that bad relationship, and we're getting ready to get married, and it's probably uh, uh, not more than three, four weeks till the wedding date. We already had, you know, gifts coming in and, uh, uh, and so forth. And <clears throat> um, I was a daily drinker. I drank country club malt liquor before I went to homeroom. Then I started drinking at lunch. Then I started drinking at 2 o'clock. I was drinking whiskey until I um, went to sleep that night. And this is in high school. So by this time, I'm drinking a lot more than that. Because of the way I drink and around the clock, I didn't have a lot of blackouts. Uh, daily drinkers tend to have, you know, very gray, little vague about what's going on, but I didn't have blackouts where I just didn't know anything. Um, but I did on occasion go on a binge on top of the around the clock drinking. And I'm not sure what the motive is or how that works, but I did it. And so I went on one of these, missed a couple of days, and my fiance uh, says, um, you know, she said, you know, where were you for the last couple of days? And I said, I I'm not really sure, but I, I, I trust me, I, it wasn't anything bad. I wasn't unfaithful. She said, well, how would you know? And I said, oh, I just know me. And so um, uh, at any rate, so uh, now she said, this is what happened. Anybody that said anything to me when I was drinking that seemed at all to criticize me, and I just, I felt crushed, I felt hurt, I felt like, you know, I you know, this is unfair, and I tried to find some way to comfort me. So she said to me, she said, I think, she said, I haven't told you this before, but my dad was an alcoholic, and he died of alcoholism, and, and uh, so I, I think maybe you need to talk to somebody. I mean, this is going to be difficult. I mean, you, you, we need to get this straightened out before we go through this wedding. Um, so all I heard was she's rejecting me, and so I am leaving. I'm going to van loose. And, uh, uh, and so... I have the <clears throat> when I got into trouble, when I had something bother me or anything else, I had to find something to comfort me, and I didn't know uh, I didn't know what else to do. As I said, obviously I didn't do too well at drugs. I'm already drinking as much as I can, but when I was overseas, they had a 
a magazine that I hadn't seen before, and it was called uh, Penthouse. And it had a section in there for people like me who were very intellectual, bright, um, about lifestyles and different variations of, you know, interaction uh, called the forum or letters section. And uh, this is new for those of you who are younger and don't know what it was like when we were growing up in the 50s. Um, the, the closest thing we had, I mean, today you can go online and find two zebras and a, you know, uh, a yuppie, but um, uh, back then we didn't have anything. The closest thing we had uh, to anything like so on the internet now was the tribal section of National Geographic. So um, I had remembered this one concept in there that was called a menage a choice. And uh, I remembered this, uh, obviously we didn't speak French at the time, but I remembered this because we had read it uh, at, uh, I'm not sure whether it was Denang or wherever it was, but anyway, we'd read it, we thought this is great, we're really going to, and and so I remembered that, and I had actually brought that up with my fiance, usually at intimate moments, uh, trying to say that this would be a good idea, but her having formerly been married to a Nixon aide, or actually maybe she was married to a Nixon aide at that time, uh, she wasn't, she was too conservative, so she wasn't going for that, so I think that now, this is, I bring this up because it's the kind of trouble we can get into without a sponsor. Um, I think that now, in order for me to have the, the people I'm going to get together with the menage, um, I need to go to, and this is another concept that I now realize I'm totally misunderstood, to a lesbian bar to find two girls that want to be with me. Um, uh, and um, if you are new and you're not sure what's wrong with that um, sentence, keep coming back. So, um, so I'm now trying to find a lesbian bar in Louisville, Kentucky, 45 years ago, or whatever it was, um, and uh, so I can find two lesbians that would like to be with me. And so I asked around, and I know that, Mike, these guys are too you know, square. They're not going to know where a lesbian bar is, so I don't ask anybody there. I ask, and at work, this guy comes, and he was an art director. He worked upstairs, and he came down and said, I understand you're looking for a lesbian bar. And I said, yeah. He said, well, here. And he writes the place and tells me and all when to go and so forth. And I go back to my office and said, now, how would that guy know where a lesbian bar was? And um, obviously, I, there were a whole lot of stuff I didn't know about. So um, I go that Saturday night, and I'm, with, and I'm, and I'm, I'm uh, sitting there at a piano bar and, um, uh, where the guy's playing piano, and there's a, a, a large woman who was there, and she was a vet. So we were having a good conversation, but I could tell there wasn't going to be any menage. And she... Uh, and and but it the time is getting on now. I smoked. Uh, I went through high school without ever smoking a cigarette. Uh, but I, the year I got out of high school, there was a movie called The Graduate. And in The Graduate, this graduate, this guy Dustin Hoffman, who graduates from uh, college, starts smoking and has an affair with an older woman. And um, I had had an affair with an older woman during my summer job, uh, and uh, started smoking. Uh, she would be about 91 now. And um, so so I am sitting there waiting for something to happen. Nobody's there. It's just the guy playing the piano and the woman. And I'm saying, uh, this guy did not know what he was talking about. When suddenly, upstairs something was going on. A door opens and there was a long cascading staircase case. And this looked like the opening scene uh, of, uh, what was the name of it? Loretta Young Show. And if you're young and you don't know these things, Google them. It's, it's important to know who these people are. So, so Loretta Young comes cascading down the staircase in this beautiful flowing gown on the TV show. It was like that in person, except on TV, everything's black and white. And in real person, this girl was redheaded. And uh, just gorgeous. And it was just like in slow motion, and we keep moving, and we hold on to each other, and we start to kiss, and we, we, we make out. And, you know, when you're in love, you can't, you know, you're afraid it'll go away. So you take another couple steps, and you start kissing again. And um, so that's what was going on. And then I remembered my mission. I said, by the way, do you have a girlfriend that we can add tonight? And she said, oh, you're into that. And I said, Oh, yeah. She said, well, why don't we get to know each other tonight, and we'll add somebody tomorrow? I said, thank God I did not marry that Republican woman. So so we're holding hands. We're kissing everything. We're going back. 
this is a story I did not share with Mike. We're going back. We get back to my house uh, apartment, and um, um, and Erica was her name. And Erica uh, is uh, she pulls out a pill that was big enough to choke a horse. Actually, it was called a quaalude, and it was a horse tranquilizer. And she said, "Would you care for one?" <clears throat> and I said, "Oh no, thank you. Um, I don't do drugs." And so as I'm hitting another uh, couple shots of wild turkey, two things happen. Erica passes out, and I found equipment that I wasn't looking for. And after three or four days, I said, this is not right. And now I don't know where to go because I had never seen Opie or Wally ever deal with this in any episode. Now, this is about the same time, Mike knows this, he didn't, I didn't broadcast to the people that I couldn't tell what was what, and so I got Erica home before, you know, uh, the crowd got up and started ringing the bell to play volleyball out in the pool, and so, or at least I hope I did, so anyway, um, and uh, uh, so about the same time I'm having other problems, obviously my love life's not going too well, and I got fired from that job, and it wasn't for misbehavior. They called me and they said, are you aware that you missed 89 days this year? And I, you know, and really I didn't obviously realize that, and so I got fired, and so now I'm fired. I don't have a job. I don't have a fiancé. I don't have a relationship you know, with anybody, um, and, uh, you know, and I can't tell anybody of my friends what, you know, uh, might be an embarrassing moment in my inability to tell what sex somebody was, so, um, so, but I was always looking for another girl before I messed up this relationship, I was always looking for another job before I messed up this job, so I already had a job lined up with McCann Erickson, the biggest ad agency in the world, so I don't, announce the fact that I got fired or was not having good relationships, so I just say, I've got this great job. So I take off, and I'm working in New York, Atlanta, and um, uh, and so what started happening was I did very good work. I won some awards. I ended up with, uh, um, I did the Coca-Cola spot with the football player and the kid. Uh, I did a lot of very good work. I was producing some music. Uh, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. And, and so I'm very young, youngest creative director they've had. I'm getting paid more money than I ever thought I would get paid. But I was starting to lose control of everything, kidneys, bowels, getting up in the morning. And um, uh, so I finally, um, they didn't even fire me from that job. They, they sent me to Atlanta for full time. That's what they do when you're really bad is they make you live in Atlanta and, and work down here. So instead of working on the big TV commercials, I'm now putting the price on a 12-pack of, you know, tab. Um, and so, you know, and I didn't last very long at that either. Um, I eventually got fired and because I'm not paying the rent and hadn't paid the rent in a long time. And I didn't have any furniture. I had a bar. I had a mattress that was soaked because I lived in a downstairs apartment and, and the retainer wall had broken. It was, but because I wasn't paying rent, I couldn't gripe about it. And finally they said, we're locking you out and I'm evicted. And um, I go up to the liquor store and um, the guy comes out and he says, uh, we know that those checks you've been writing are no good and uh, we need to ask you not to come into this liquor store anymore. And as embarrassing and as humiliating as that was, the only thought that came to my mind was, oh, God, I hope he gives me this whiskey. Uh, and he did. And so um, I walk out with that bottle of whatever the cheapest bourbon I could get was. And suddenly, it was like slow motion. I have in a box everything I owned when I got to AA. It was a pair of yellowish brownish pants, which I thought made me look like I was somebody that was just getting ready to go play golf at the country club, a blue uh, polo type shirt, and a pair of loafers, Weegeons, that had a, holes in the bottom of them. And I carried a forty five because I had gotten very paranoid my last couple of three years thinking that somebody was after me. So I carried this forty five. So I go in, I get the, I've got this bottle of whiskey. I go out and I come around a corner uh, not too far from where my apartment that I'm now being locked out of is and that bottle just kind of slowly slipped out of my hands 
and hit the concrete um, and poured out over the uh, ground. And I had no way to get a drink. I had nowhere to go. Um, I was already shaken. Um, and I got so angry at God for rejecting me, for making sure that I wasn't one of the chosen ones, um, that I just started screaming and yelling at the top of my lungs. And I was yelling and cursing God, God blank you, God blank you, God blank you, because I was angry at what God had done and for denying me what I was due, what I was supposed to have. And for the first in my life, I felt absolutely dark, deep hole. There was no way for me to get out of this. And I had one in the chamber, and I get ready to pull the trigger, and I'm aiming at my head, and I'm screaming at God, and um, uh, yelling, God blanket, God blanket, God blanket. And then something hit, and I started saying, God help me, God help me, God help me. And a moment of peace um, came over me, and I uh, saw this scene from a film I'd seen a hundred times, called Days of Wine and Roses, and it was where Jack Klugman walks up to Jack Lemon's character and says, I understand you need help, and um, uh, I'm from Alcoholics Anonymous. Jack Klugman says that to Lemon in the movie. And so I walked up to a phone booth on a street corner. I had no money, and I just called the operator, and the operator, somebody like you who worked on a committee, a public information committee, had gone to Bell South and had told them about the new central office in Atlanta. And so this woman, uh, when I called the operator, I didn't know who to call. I called the operator and told the operator I was an alcoholic and I needed help. And because somebody like you had gone and worked with them to let them know that the office was there, they connected me with a woman named Helen in Atlanta, um, who was the new head of Atlanta central office. And... Helen is still the head of the Atlanta Central Office, um, and this is over 38 years ago, and she now has uh, 47 years. She had nine back then. And so she said, honey, I know what's going on, and I know how you feel, and I'm sending somebody out to pick you up. And a guy named Ed came to pick me up, and I was sitting there, and I still had that 45 in my lap, um, and he didn't act scared. He didn't uh, act like there was something, you know, he didn't look down on me. He just said, uh, uh I know what you're going through. I know what you're feeling. And he started talking about his own experience. And unlike a lecture, it's what makes AA work. Instead of us getting up and telling what's supposed to be and how things work, he shared from his innermost being what it felt like when he reached his bottom. And I started to trust him, and I listened to what he said. And I did the most complete third step I've ever taken that day. I just said, can you take me someplace? I need help. And he took me to a place to dry out. And um, uh, I was in DTs for about five or six days. And um, one of the old timers there, a guy named Joe Hubbard, had his hand. He put it on my wrist, and he just stayed with me. And people from that point until today always were just there making sure that I had whatever I needed to have the opportunity to stay sober, to have a good life, to live a very rich life, to love and be loved, to have everything that I was always looking for. And when I had studied in, uh, you know, in school to find some way, this was, this was a gift that was given to me. I couldn't find it. I couldn't learn it. I didn't know what to do, but when I cried out for God, he gave me this gift. I have not had a desire for a drink since that day. and That's 38 years and about four or five months ago. Not one day. And this has nothing to do with me. This has to do with this great power that reacts when we are honest and when we say, I need help. And uh, I was given a, a, somebody had a car that I can use to drive back up to uh, Louisville, uh, my parents weren't living there, my family wasn't there, but I just thought that's the only place I knew anybody that I felt comfortable in. So I moved back to Louisville, and my first year or so I was staying in an apartment that somebody else owns, and I was helping people, you know, you know, staying with them when they were trying to dry out. Um, and God was 
God gave me everything I needed. It says when we take the third step that he provides everything you need. So I didn't have any money. I didn't really have anything. But I had a new start on life. And I had a place where I could meet people and go to AA meetings. Um, and uh, I got a job in AA. I didn't get a job in person right at first, but I got a job in AA. And it was something I needed desperately to be useful, to be valuable to somebody. And I had brain damage. I couldn't speak very well. I didn't listen very well. I would get confused easily for the first few months. And so um, uh, this was... <clears throat> But they gave me, so I couldn't do anything with math, and they wouldn't give me a job that had anything to do with math, like making the coffee. So um, I ended up, uh, I, at that time, if you came into AA in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, it was mandatory that you learned how to smoke, because um, uh, by this time in the meeting, I would not be able to see anything except a, va a little fading, you know, uh, smog there on the front row. I couldn't see anybody by the third row, just the way it was, so... I was the ashtray guy, and we had these ashtrays that were round, made out of corrugated metal that were gold, red, green, and blue. They were kind of like Christmas tree ornaments, you know, uh, with a bunch of stale cigarettes in them. And so um, uh, I was the ashtray guy, and I was a good ashtray guy, uh, and I kept them, you know, I had a Brillo pad, and I kept these things really clean until I found out about um, uh, the tradition of rotation that we talk about in AA, which is a way that's designed for us egomaniacs not to just take everything over and do what we want. So uh, they came to me, and I was an ashtray guy for a long time. They came to me and said, we got a new ashtray guy. His name is Raymond. And he I said, I don't think so. And uh, they said, no, 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 no. But, you know, he needs this job to, to save his life. He needs this job to stay sober. But we got a new job for you. Uh, you're going to be the chairperson. I said, I'm going to be the chairperson? No, 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 the chairperson. And, um, you know, but I'm not stupid. We only had 10 ashtrays, and we've got 40 uh, seats, so this is a promotion. And I have had a job in Alcoholics Anonymous, whether right now I'm a greeter, whatever it is, I've had a job for uh, the 30 and a half years I've been sober. I've had a job. Uh, all of that time, except for about three years between 12 and 15. I got kind of burned out when I was 12 years sober, and I decided that I wanted to, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, that I wanted to get in touch with me. That was um, 25 years ago or whatever, and it was a time when people were starting to get in touch with their inner feelings and their inner child and stuff. And so I started looking for my inner child and so forth, and uh, by the time I was 15 years sober, I was in a hotel room in Los Angeles trying to see if I could find a gun to put a bullet in my head. And uh, uh, and so I would suggest if you want to find yourself, find your inner child, whatever you want to find, that while you're doing it, you keep having a job and trying to help other people get sober, and that way you make it, because not everybody ends up like I did. A lot of people who just shoot themselves in the head were doing exactly what I did, but God, again, helped save my life. So... These guys that I got sober with believe that we continue to work on ourselves, that we continue to work on uh, our, our, who we are, that we continue to grow. And so they made it very clear to me that um, this was not a one-time deal, that I had to keep working on it, keep working on it, keep working on it. And so my first three uh, house cleanings were okay, but I didn't really get to any root cause so they talk about. And I was getting more and more angry and more and more... Just I felt frustrated, and finally I got through, and I did what that root cause inventory that we're talking about, um, and I realized that I was very angry at everybody. I was angry at God. There was nobody I wasn't angry with, um, and I and I there were all kinds of problems I was dealing with that I hadn't even talked about, and so I start going through. And if you are new, or if you've forgotten, and because you've been here, the way in which we have great reward from this program is usually during the night step when we start making amends. And so I go through that, and I'm making amends, and I go to this Linda Baptist Church to make uh, an apology to them for calling them hypocrites and doing things to them for so many years. And on the night that I got up on Sunday night to ask if I could be useful to that church again, uh, there was a beautiful blonde uh, sitting in the congregation um, and she was your al speaker this morning, and I fell in love with her then. We, it was six years before we got married because it was the timing wasn't right. Um, but I, she's the only person I felt about like that, and that was right then. And I, 
uh, went up to her and I asked her out, and um, uh, and uh, she was, if you heard her talk, she was a little bit naive, and she was kind of, anyway, she had to mellow out a little bit, and I had to get a little bit of control going before we worked out, but six years later, we started dating and got married. And I would not have that partnership or that wife if I had not been doing an amend. Everything good that has come to me has come to me as a result of me trying to be useful to somebody else or try to continue to grow by working the steps or the traditions in this program. I'll do something for what I think is a certain reason, but it's not. And that's what I was talking about earlier today in the, in the workshop, that if I am doing something useful for you, my brother, my sister, then God takes care of all my needs, and more, he takes care of meeting the wishes of my heart. And I heard that at this conference in 1977 from Chuck Chamberlain, who was greatly admired in this program, and whenever people were around him, they just felt like they were in the presence of this tremendous power, and it wasn't him, and he didn't pretend to have that power. It's just that he was constantly trying to surrender to this God, this loving God. So now that happens, and and uh, and Barbara wasn't even the kind of girl I was looking for. Barbara was a seminary student and a good girl. I was kind of looking for a new dancer who needed spiritual guidance. So uh, my last amend on that round was making a, uh, an amends to another church um, where I had actually destroyed some of the property. And I go in, and I can't find anybody to apologize to anybody to make amends with, and and uh, then I realized I had not forgiven God. I'm asking God to help me in the morning and thanking God at night, but I had not, for, I had not, I, I didn't trust God, I didn't feel connected to God, and that's what, uh, at that point, I realized I need to forgive God, and while that sounds arrogant, if I have a anger towards somebody, I need to forgive them. I may be the one with the problem, but I need to forgive them. And so I started praying and forgiving God, and one of the most powerful and profound experiences I've ever had took place. I felt like everything was lifted off my shoulder and taken out of my chest, and um, and for the first time ever, I felt like I was one of God's children. I felt like I was connected. Um, I felt what changed my life was I, so, I actually felt like I was a spiritual being, having a human experience rather than a human being having a spiritual experience. And that changed my life. I can tell how I'm doing spiritually very easily. If I sit down at an AA meeting and I hear somebody saying something and this guy over here is obnoxious and I'm looking at the people and I'm very angry at these people and I'm judging these people, I'm not in a good place spiritually. But if I sit there and even if the person has trouble, I'm thinking, you know, God can do such a great work with this 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 person that's sitting here, if they're just willing. If I love you and I'm hopeful that you will have the best life possible and I want you to have everything I wanted for myself, I'm in a good place. So now I've had this spiritual experience, the spiritual awakening. I'm trying to find God's will and to do it. And I ran with a bunch of guys that went to Gethsemane and every, uh, every February they went there and... Uh, very quiet, and you would do your fifth step with your sponsor or a priest. And I'm trying to figure out what God's will is. And this priest gets up and he says, do you boys know what God's will is? And there were about 15 of us. And I was the youngest in sobriety. And nobody ventured a guess. And he said, doing God's will is simple. It's to do the very best you can right at this moment with whatever God has given you to be useful to the person next to you. No more, no less. And I had been the guy who would always sit down with a cocktail napkin and write about 20 different things where I showed a path where I was going to get this car and get this job so I could impress that girl and sleep with her and back and forth. I was always, always centered around what I could do to make me feel better, to make me feel uh, more love, to make me feel like I fit in, to make me feel like I was getting what I deserve. And that changed my life entirely. Barbara and I have been able to go to meetings in 48 states, 
and about 20 different countries. And we've met a lot of wonderful people, and we've participated in a lot of wonderful things. And to get up on a day and to know that I can be useful to somebody is fulfilling. And that's the way... <clears throat> And that's wonderful, and it's wonderful to celebrate and to think that I have a good day, but it's not always like that. In 2005, uh, Barbara and I weren't able to have children, but we had a dog, a Norwegian elk hound called Booger Bear, that went every place to all these conferences with us, and we had to put him to sleep. And honestly, Barbara talked about it too. It's like we didn't know if we would, you know, cry for each other the way we did for this dog. He was so wonderful, and um, we had to put him to sleep. And we go to um, Toronto, to the International that year. And um, I, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> and I go to have a physical right after we get back and find out that um, I have esophageal cancer. Esophageal cancer is 98, 99% fatal. It's just not something you want. It's a lot rarer than uh, pancreatic or liver cancer, but it's one of the big three, and it's very difficult. And Barbara had lost her mom and dad within a few days of each other earlier that year. We had put our dog to sleep, and my mother was very sick, and in fact she died um, not long after uh, I found out I had cancer. So I could not tell Barbara what was going on, because um, I didn't <coughs> I didn't want to um, bring more burden on a woman who just lost her mom and dad and put our dog to sleep, who was like our only child. Um, I didn't want to tell her anything until I had found a solution. And so I look and I find, and because I couldn't, didn't want her to know, I couldn't tell you because you don't gossip. And so... Um, uh, so I'm trying to, with just about two or three people knowing what's going on with me, find a way that I can live through this fatal cancer. Um, and, in fact, I did find somebody, and uh, it was a physician who had, who had designed this entire new procedure where basically you take out everything in the chest. They took out 31 lymph nodes. They took all of my esophagus out. They got a team of another 15 surgeons sitting over here while they're doing this. They take two-thirds of my stomach out, and this team is creating a uh, solid piece of tubing uh, that's about 18 inches long out of the stomach material so that they can replace uh, the esophagus itself. So they had this procedure in place. And I call out there, and I am going to be speaking that Saturday night in Key West. And I got a phone call that said, we cannot take you. We can't take the insurance that you have. And I had Aetna. It wasn't like a, a no-name insurance, but they didn't pay enough, and they didn't pay it quickly enough. So I could not have – I didn't have a solution. It might be out there, but it wasn't out there for me. And now – if you've been to the sunlight of the spirit and seen this and suddenly this new darkness prevails, it's darker than it ever was before you you found uh, this relationship with God. And I'm down there to speak. I couldn't talk at all. I was so angry. I'd start to say something and then I'd start cursing God the same way I was when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous in the first place. And now um, I... <clears throat> A friend of mine down there, whom I told about this to, said, when I can't get to God, I don't worry about what I'm saying. I just say anything I can because God understands my heart. Do you have a, anything that you've memorized? And I had learned the 23rd Psalm to recite to the PTA in the third grade. And so I started, uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I started doing that over and over. And finally, I started to feel some connection. And in fact... Um, I did feel like um, uh, I was connected a small amount. And my sponsor, my first sponsor here, was a guy named Jack Sullivan. And Jack had called me and talked to me on the day he came out of the doctor's office and was told that he had six malignant brain tumors. And while I'm talking to him on the phone, this is earlier, when I'm talking to him on the phone, um, I'm saying, Jack, I don't hear any fear in your voice. What's going on? And he says, the big book uh, tells us 
um, that we will lose our fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. He said, if God has been this good to me here, just imagine what he's got waiting on the other side. And all of a sudden, it was just like that day where I had forgiven God, where everything just came from my back, and um, I felt like I, once again, God was there, and he was going to take care. And the way I would have written this is they would have called back and said, you know what? We're going to take that insurance that you have. And, and you know, it would have been one of those things where they said there was a light that shed through the, the sky and the doctor was there and, and it was God because he was sorry that he didn't take me back at Linda Baptist Church when I went down the aisle. And now everything's going to be okay and I'm going to be healed. That's not what happened. They called and said, we still can't take you, but our chief of surgery, who actually has uh, refined this procedure, just went up to a place in uh, Rochester, New York, called Strong Memorial Hospital. So I call up there. They've already sent my labs and all the photographs and everything else. And I call, and I finally get this guy. And uh, he says, I don't care about the insurance. I want to teach this procedure to these surgeons up here. So can you be up here in two days? So now I need to tell Barbara that I've got cancer because, um, you know, well, because we're going on a trip. So, uh, and just so you know, I didn't lie to her about not having cancer. I just said, I have some, um, uh, some damaged tissue in my esophagus and they're going to have to remove it. So um, I didn't tell her I didn't have cancer. I just didn't quite cover the whole thing. But now I've got to tell her that I've got cancer. Now she's having a tough time. But I feel comfortable once I, I understood that. And I had remembered talking to Jack Sullivan that day when he said, um, when he told me that he was going and he felt no fear. And I thought, well, if I'm going, God will take care of me and he'll take care of Barbara. So we're now driving up to this place up there. But you still have some trepidation. I've still got some fear. And I don't know who's going to take care of us. So we on the way up there and we, um, somebody had called on our behalf. And when we got to the hotel, there were 23 people there that basically stayed there and around us the whole time we were up there. Um, and they were our new home group in al new home group in AA, and they loved us, and they took care of Barbara, and they got her out of there, and they took care of me in the room when she was gone to give her a chance to spell. And it was just, it's like AA or like the rest of the world is supposed to be when you're loved and you're one of God's children. And we went the next day for me to meet this surgeon, and the first place we went was the chapel, and in the chapel, up on the wall, written in letters that were about a foot and a half deep in gold, Strong Memorial Hospital, endowed by Dr. Leonard Strong, who was Bill Wilson's brother-in-law, who helped start the Alcoholic Foundation, without which I wouldn't have been here alive in the first place. My experience is this, and I've been cancer-free now for 10 years. My experience is this. We don't have to suffer. We don't have to, to be great intellects. We don't have to understand everything there is about this disease. All we need to know is that if I grab the hand of the man in front of me and follow him and bring somebody along with me, God will guide me. He'll take care of whatever I need. He'll love me, and he'll allow me to be useful to you and in being useful to you, I'm fulfilled. You're going to like me, love me. I'm going to get paid. And all of this tremendous brainstorming, trying to figure out how I could get power to endow, to endow me, to make me uh, the guy with the power. That whole stupid way I approached it is gone. And all I have to really do is say, thank you, God, and reach out to help the guy behind me. And if you're here and you think that this is only about not taking a drink, you need to read the literature and you need to be around people that have been here for a while. Because this is a whole brand new world of love with a caring, compassionate, loving father. And all we have to do is take care of each other and love each other. That's my wish for you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. 
Thank you very much. 